one of the events that we always look forward to is the Bible studies from our Archbishop. And do you know what I mean? Dr. William Young was from Chicago. Dr. William Young was from Boston. Dr. William Young was of Pittsburgh. And your gracious Bishop Anthemus, Holy Muslim, Bishop Sebastian of Zero, Reverend Clergy, Mr. Potros, Chairman of Leadership 100, and beloved members and distinguished brothers and sisters present here in this Leadership 130th meeting and in this Bible study. The uh, pericope, and I explain again by the term pericope means an extended passage from the Bible. The pericope today is the very last verses of the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. This is the way the Gospel of Matthew ends. And let me now read this pericope first in the Greek to hear the sound of the original and then in the English. Ide eldeka mathite eporeftisan istin galilea isto oros u etaxato aftis o Isus ke idontes afton prosekinisan ide edistasan και προσελθόν ο Ιησούς ελάνησε να αυτοίς λέγον εδόθημη πάσα εξουσία εν ουρανό και επί της γης πορευθέντες ούν μαθητεύσατε πάντα τα έθνη παπτίζοντες αυτούς εις το όνομα του Πατρός και του Ιού και του Αγίου Πνεύματος διδάσκοντες αυτούς τυρίν πάντα όσα είναι τη λάμινη μην και ειδού επομεθή μόνη μην πάσα στα σημέρας έως της συνδυλίας του αιώνα. <coughs> the English translation, one of the English translations existing and circulating. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain in which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And Lord, I am with you always to the cross of the age. This is one of the uh, texts or pericopes known as the post-resurrection appearances of Christ. This is the last one, and as you notice, ends with this final statement by the Lord and stops there. It's in the Gospel of Luke and in the Book of Acts that we have the description of the ascension that followed. But Matthew stops here, stops with this appearance, post resurrection appearance of Christ. The text has basically could be divided into three main parts. It's the opening part of the narrative when Jesus appears. Then is a very serious statement by the Lord. And the third part is the assurance that he will be with them, with us, to the end of the ages. It's a beautifully written in terms of literary style, and it displays the basic characteristic of the Gospel of Matthew in his understanding of Christ. For the evangelist of the Gospel of Matthew, 
Christ is, of course, the incarnate Son of God, perfect God, the perfect man. But the main characteristic projected through the gospel is Jesus as the superb and parallel teacher, the rabbi that comes and puts an end to any rabbi because he is the perfect rabbi, the perfect <coughs> teacher. This is why in the Gospel of Matthew, we have this beautiful text that is the Sermon on the Mount, a really eloquent teaching exercise. And also throughout the Gospel, we have Jesus as the rabbi, the teacher. I'm saying that because if you go to the Gospel of Mark, there Christ appears less teaching and much more doing. He appears like the one who has the authority of performing miracles and amazing things and at the same time suffering. So for one, Christ appears as the one, the cross and the resurrection, the authority and the humiliation. Luke offers the picture of Christ in a very strong philanthropic aspect. This is why in the Gospel of Luke we have the parables of the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, the Pharisee and the, the, pro, and the uh, uh, tax collector. In other words, expressions that show the philanthropic aspect. Christ as a healer, as a, someone who is doing well continuously. Something that would, Luke will repeat in his book of Acts, that he passed his life healing and comforting. And in the Gospel of John, of course, we have Christ as an amazing revealer of the ultimate truth. So for the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is the very epitome of the final absolute teacher revealing the truth and leading the people to real life. They are text begins with the phrase, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. It is not without significance, these eleven disciples. Matthew would like to make clear the pain from the betrayal of Judas talks about the eleven. He would say the disciples went. It says the eleven, not the twelve. Twelve is a term used frequently in the gospel, but unfortunately now here we have eleven. They are interpreters already in antiquity and contemporary exegetes uh, pointed out that there is a possibility that there might be some other people in addition to the eleven. Because St. Paul talks about the appearance of Christ to 500 people. And we don't have any other information except for Paul. So what, when this happened? Might have happened here. But here the evangelists would like to point out the 11. So he talks about the 11 disciples. The they went to Galilee, to the mountain, to, to which Jesus had directed them. Now, Galilee is, as you know, the northern part of what we know today as the state of Israel, neighboring to Lebanon and Syria. And it has as a characteristic the Lake of Galilee, known also under the name Lake Tiberias, Tiberias or Genesaret, Genesaret, has three names. But it's a considerable lake, and it was a lake in which turbulence and storms were very frequent. So they had frequent shipwrecks and other things. It was a rather rough kind of big lake, like a sea, actually, like an ocean. And around this lake, we have places like Capernaum, well known from the activities of Christ, Nazareth, is it northwest of this kind of thing in Galileo's borders? 
Galilee has been called in the Gospels by an additional name, Galilea ton Ethnon, Galilee of the Nations. Why? Because the population there was mixed. Whereas in Jerusalem you have a clearly, in Judea in other words, which is the southern part, you have a rather clear Jewish population. Galilee was known for a mixed population. And that was a place after Nazareth that the Lord started his public ministry. So now he directs them back to Galilee, obviously aiming at telling them, this is a place we started, this is a place we finished my earthly ministry. It's interesting that the verb, and I have the opportunity throughout this exegesis to insist on some words that are very specific in the Greek text, in the original. The verb we use that Jesus sent them is to us who attacks at this. The verb does not mean sent them, means that directed them to a specific place, appointed them there, even placed them there. It's, in other words, it's a very deliberate directive to a specific place. There are English translations that translate the term with the verb summoned, to the place where Jesus summoned them. Summoned would mean, of course, he asked them to be together, but it might be a reference to the original call, which happened in Galilee. walking by Galilee, and here comes Peter, Andrew, John, James, etc. So everything was there. So there might be a reference to the original call to discipleship and apostleship. Then they see him, he directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Worship the original is prosekini san. Proskino means a bowing down in a gesture of worship and recognition of authority. For us, sometimes means venerate the line. But originally, in a prosekini san, proskino, it's a clear, typical gesture of recognition of highest authority here, divine authority. That's, that's important. We don't have it before. This proskinis, this worship, this bowing down. But some doubt that. Again, the original says, Ide edistasan. What is edistasan? Is it doubted? Could be one of the possibilities. Could be hesitated. Distazo, I hesitate. Distazo involves a sense of mixture of embarrassment and confusion. It might have an element of doubt. So it's a very, very rich term. So if you say doubt here in the English, but just be sure that you have this complete sense that means hesitation, doubt, there is a modern expression, a little bit on the sophisticated side. This is a condition of conceptual dissonance. How do you like the term? Conceptual dissonance. A disharmony in their conceptual processes. They didn't know what, what happened here. It's a, it's a condition of hesitation, confusion. We have the word ethicism in another instance when in a case the disciples were in a, in a boat, but the Lord was outside praying and the mother came down and as the boat was just sailing, 
he appeared on the end over there. Peter, somehow, being always a very uh, energetic person with, with impulses, just jumped and started walking on the water to go and meet Jesus on the land. But as he was walking, this, the, the narrative is really beautiful, feeling the strong, the strength of the wind, he started sinking. And Jesus somehow reaches his hand and raises him and says to him, Oh, he walk is dead, oh man of little faith. In a evistasas, the same verb, vistasas, which means here diminished faith, confusion, you did something you didn't think that you would do. It's, it's a condition of a complexity of psychological and mental condition. So that here we have the disciples, as they see Jesus, they worship, but here some doubt. Some doubted. Matthew is using a perfect Greek language. If he wanted to say exactly what we say, some, he would say, having seen him, he thought Prosecutinus, Tines the son, a business son. He doesn't say Tines, say in the, uses a definitive article, E, Omicron Yorker. Who are these E? Are Tines or are all the disciples? They worship, but at the same time, they were hesitant, showing the condition. It's a possibility for both interpretations. So that the very same who worship were hesitant, or some, because this is a valid some of them just. Now, we have a reference to the same condition in another appearance of Christ. When he appeared, and the disciples were perplexed again. And he told them, Why are you reacting that way? And in the original, in a detail is me, an avenge, and the scandition. Why thoughts of doubt come to your heart? Come close and touch me, and find out that I am real. And the Jesus that you know. It's a beautiful parallel thing. So we know that the disciples always had to face this kind of situation. It's, now, let's be realistic with the situation. You have these disciples. They had been with Christ for three years. They saw him doing continuous miracles. They heard him, and as in the Gospel of John is recorded, no one ever talked or spoke like Christ. They had this experience. They expect the establishment of the kingdom of God very soon. Instead, here is the Last Supper, Gethsemane, the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion. It's a big blow. I mean, it's something unbearable. It's something that is so, so, so big in event that really breaks the human existence in terms of trying to understand what happened. On top of that, here comes the resurrection in three days. So the disciples face a totally unusual situation. And they have to absorb this kind of thing in a very short period of time. That's another point. They don't have time to deal with. And as you know, if you notice, the descriptions of the appearances of Christ are very limited. They are not extensive. They were more than the gospel say, because it could say everything, but it, they, we don't have much. So we can understand now the condition of the disciples. Try to find, even we encounter the expression in one of the appearances of Christ, apistundes apotisharas. They didn't believe because they were absorbed by joy.
This is unbelievable. To indicate something which is beyond that of normal conditions. So just think of the disciples in this kind of condition now. And then Jesus came and said to them, uh, sorry, the translation is unfair to the original. In the original, we read proselthon. If we had came, we would have elthon, not proselthon. Proselthon means coming to a specific point, to specific people. In other words, to put it in a contemporary context, we came to Naples, Florida, but we proceeded to leadership on hundred. It's to, the, the come is a general term. Everywhere. Proselyte is come to the specific location, the specific people. It's a woman of Jesus. In the Gospels, normally, people come to Jesus, ask for healing, ask for other things. Here is a, one of the few cases when Jesus comes to the disciples, the reason no. And then, and said to them, said to them is just one verb, said. The original has no verbs. A line is said, level. He spoke, say. I don't know why they omit it in the translation. The reason is an expression of saying. But again, we are in a position to understand this kind of difference. In the trial of Jesus, you remember, Peter is sitting just outside, following what's going on. And the handmaid of the high priest comes out and says to Peter, you are with this man. Peter says no. A second time, a third time. And the handman said, I knew that you were with him. The way you talk shows that you are from Galilee. You were with him. It's exactly what I said we can understand this kind of thing here is Lanya in the last is not simply speaking, but speaking in a certain way. Here, you say, for instance, oh, I know that you are from the South. Oh, I know that you are from Brooklyn, from the way you talk. This is Lanya. This is Lano. Speaking is just articulated in terms of current, generally applicable language. So then the, the Greek is emphatic, a lanya as a main term, level, same, is a participle. Here comes a declaration. It's a, a very, very high, absolute level declaration. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This passage, is perhaps one of the two or three passages in the Bible which establishes the absolute dignity and value of human nature. The value of human nature, of course, as we know from the Old Testament, repeated in the New, is that we are made in the image and likeness of God. That's important. What we have here, Jesus now speaks not as the second person of the Trinity. He speaks as God and man. The authority is now given to him as God and human being. It's a human nature now that has this kind of authority in heaven and on earth. And that was already pointed by the early interpreters of the Gospel of Matthew, John Chrysostom, Cyril of Alexandria, Theodore, later Zygabinos, and modern interpreters. 
is a passage establishing human value and dignity beyond any description. Authority given on her in heaven and on earth. This is a declaration. And we have something more elaborate. When you have the opportunity to be at home or your room and look at the Bible and open the letter of St. Paul to Philippians, chapter 2, there we have a description that is much more elaborate of this idea. I'm reading quickly to you. And this is, Paul is using it to emphasize the humility of Christ. So he said, please feel and behave like Christ, who, being a God, he did not think of an item to be snatched, to be equal to God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, find himself in full likeness to a human being, and having himself found as a human being, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God, now here we are, therefore God have exalted him exceedingly, hyperipsosem is the original, and gave him name above every name, so that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess Lord Jesus Christ for the glory of God. This is a fully theologically presented idea of having authority over everything. Now, having done this kind of declaration, Christ proceeds now to the, what is, has been called by the interpreters the Great Commission. Commission to his disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go is fine, but again, the original says por efendis. Porevo is a verb of movement that means walking. You don't porevo is by a car or a train. You fly or you drive, but porevo means walk. So here is the idea that now you have to start walking. Walking in order to go out of Palestine and make disciples of all nations. Remember what, what we said about Matthew emphasizing the teaching aspect of Christ. In other Gospels, we have go, look at Mark, and proclaim, here Matthew says, make disciples. The idea of teaching people and create real disciples. So the idea here projected is the discipleship as the end product, not simply the declaration. And that's important. Because sometimes it's easy to declare the faith. And people listen, do whatever they want to do. But now go from this declaration to cultivate and teach and make real disciples of Christ. That's the point. That's the point here. Many disciples of all nations. The uh, universality is a basic item. It's, you remember what we read in the passage from Philippians and in the Gospels and in the uh, 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 description of the Ascension in the book of Acts. Go out of Jerusalem and Samaria and Palestine to the ends of the earth. It's always an open great commission. Go out, just reach every place. And teaching them, but 
here is now. In fact, it is on this, including them into the new entity which is the church by baptism. Not just have them gathered and ask them now who is believing, and okay, you are a member now. No. You have to be to hear the, the declaration, to be taught, and be baptized. Baptizing them, and here is the very formula used through the centuries and today all over the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. A magnificent declaration of the Trinitarian nature of God and of the baptism and inclusion, incorporation into the body of the church through this declaration of the Trinity. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Sometimes we do that without thinking, but that's the case here. And, now again, the teaching aspect. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Matthew is very eager. He is very eager in saving, preserving and presenting this aspect of Christ. It's not simply general truth about saving. It's a teaching that leads to way of life, way of thinking, way of behaving in general. It's a total immersion of the human being into a new condition. But that needs teaching. That is not enough to just have a declaration of faith. So just teaching becomes a very basic thing, but becomes with a target to observe all that I have commanded you. Uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, the Lord said in his last uh, speech to them, chapters 13 to 17 in the Gospel of John, because before he was arrested, if you love me, if you believe in me, if you love me, do what I told you to do. Iagabatame, dirisate. And here again, teach, observe all that I have commanded you. Sometimes, uh, contemporary people trying to be politically correct, they say, well, let's compromise a few things. Okay. Uh, we can cut this, cut that. The substance is just to love. Okay. What, what else? Here is something. Observe all that I have commanded you. There is nothing in the teaching of Christ that could be secondary or negotiable or compromised. People are free. Jesus says at some point when he encountered the difficulty of acceptance of some things, he said, to ask even his own disciples, do you want to live? Because some people, after hearing something left, do you want to live? You are free. But if you stay with me, you have to be clear about observing all that I have commanded you. Now, up to this point, we have a declaration of authority. As human being too, and we have the great commission, go, teach, make disciples, teach, baptize, and ask them to observe all that I ask you to observe. I'm not going to leave you alone. Behold, I am with you always. In the original Sindelia to the Orcus, at the end of this world, forever, there is no limit in the future, in this future. He is with us. He is going to be with us. That's why there is a big difference here between a philosopher or a teacher, as there were plenty of them known in the Hellenistic world of that time, and Jesus. Jesus is not saying, do this, do that. He said, I'm with you. I'm going to, uh, to be with you, give my grace to you, so that you will be able to do things. 
This is why the great fathers of the church, among them, St. John Chrysostom, uh, very frequently, not once, throughout his work, he said, nothing is impossible to a big believer. Not because he or she has the human power. That's very important, necessary component. But because you have the presence of Christ. Through the presence of Christ, as he says, our soul becomes light. Could more easily disengage from the heavy weights that sometimes are pressing us down. That's a big difference. So then, this is the thing, and the church, as you see, kept the formula of the baptism here and kept this great commission as a basic kind of item. Of course, what is behind this thing is the reality of the resurrection. Teaching public ministry for three years, yes. Crucifixion, carrying the sins and guilt of the world, yes. But the resurrection was the one that was the seal, the final seal. And it was after the resurrection that Christ says, authority, authority, full authority, has been given to me. And then, obviously, anticipating what will happen after being ascended, he told them, no matter what, I am going to be with you. In an invisible, yet real presence. This is the pericope that we have been through. This is a text that has attracted tremendous attention. Uh, just in two years recently, I have here a collection of books and articles written on specifically this text. In two years, there were more than a hundred. Not to talk about the commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew, that are hundreds, but specific studies on these four verses. More than a hundred just in two years. If, if, if I made a full list, I have here three pages with, with titles of more than a hundred authors. We could talk thousands. People are still dealing with this text. It involves the disciples. We are the disciples. And we are involved in this process of being the carriers of this ultimate commission. Go and disciples of all nations, baptize, teaching, I am with you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Your Eminence. As always, uh, you exceeded our expectations.